to start. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to BC214 uh, lecture on developing the human spirit. Oh, there's no mic. Oh, there's no other mic here. Oh, okay. All right. Let's uh, pray and we'll uh, we'll start. Let's pray and start. Right. Father, we thank you for another day, another opportunity to get together and uh, study your word, consider what you are teaching us in your word. And uh, Lord, we pray that you'll open our hearts and minds and write your word in our hearts, write your word in our minds. Help us to understand and help us to walk in these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, welcome everyone. So, last week in our course on developing the human spirit, we were uh, talking about living the spirit-filled life. We did lesson 12, walking in the spirit, how the human spirit should be under the Holy Spirit. Um, and so we considered two main passages from Galatians 5 and Ephesians 5, where the Apostle Paul is teaching us about walking in the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, and living in the Spirit, or living the Spirit-filled life, living a life under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So now, let's go to lesson number 13. It's a slight change in what we have been considering. Earlier, we talked about the five faculties of the human spirit. That means um, these, these faculties are things that the human spirit is capable of. Uh, primarily, it is a channel through which it can receive information. Just like our faculties of seeing, hearing, uh, feeling. So we are receiving information through these. And then we process it and we do something. So the faculties, the spiritual faculties, help us to receive and process information, uh, primarily from the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit or is communicating to us through our spirit, uh, through these faculties. Today we want to talk about the seven functions of the human spirit. That means this is what the human spirit does. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, uh, when I say, you know, seven functions, uh, I just put them together, meaning, I'm not saying, okay, the Bible says your spirit has seven functions. You know, it's not like that. But just based on, you know, my understanding, and then I say, okay, what is the human spirit capable of doing? Right? What can it do? And especially in terms of importance, priority, right? So then I, I just put these seven functions down, right? So it's not necessarily like, Okay, chapter and verse, you know, seven functions of the Spirit or nine gifts of the Spirit or nine fruit of the Spirit. It's not in that same category, right? Where the Bible tells us about the nine gifts of the Spirit. The Bible tells us about the nine fruits or nine fruit of the Spirit. It's, it's in the Scriptures. So like that, we don't have a passage saying the functions of the human spirit are, you know, this, 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 this. It's not like that. But it's more of a, a, a reflection, a, a learning, an observation that, uh, based on which uh, I, I put this down and said, okay, if somebody says, or somebody wants to think, um, what does my human spirit do? What, what purpose does it serve? I know it has these faculties, that means this is how it can receive information, and this is how God communicates to me through those faculties. But what 
purpose does the human spirit serve? What can it do? So then I put these seven functions down, saying, in, in my understanding, these seven seem to be very important. Okay? So it's coming from that perspective. It's not necessarily chapter and verse. Right? So let me mention this. And again, we're not, uh, you know, each one of these, we could, you know, maybe write a book on it, like conscience. You can write a book on conscience. But uh, I'll just mention this and try to understand what, what this is, right? So the first function of the human spirit is conscience which means knowing what's right and wrong. And even the unbeliever has a conscience. Like every human person is born with a conscience. Right? That means because we, have, we are actually spiritual beings, spirit beings. We are born with a conscience. And you see this very, very, very uh, nicely given to us in Romans chapter 2, verse 15, where uh, it says that the law of God has been written uh, in our hearts. Verse Romans 2, verse 15, who show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So, the law of God written in our hearts, it's already put in your spirit, the law of God, that the right and the wrong. And the conscience is the voice of the spirit. That means it is your human spirit speaking up according to the law that's put in your heart. It's telling you what's right, what's wrong. And so we're all born with this conscience, with this law of God written in our hearts. But over time, the conscience can be suppressed. The conscience can be, the Bible says, it can be seared. That means it can be killed. You know, that means you, you, you silence the voice of your conscience. And the conscience is no longer speaking. It's no longer telling you what's right and wrong. So sometimes you wonder, how could somebody do like that? Doesn't he even have a conscience? How come he has no conscience? Ah, that's because over time the conscience has been suppressed and maybe even silenced. No longer. There's nothing inside him telling him right and wrong because they keep quiet, keep quiet. I don't want to listen to you. And that voice is gone. So somebody can come to that state where there is no conscience. There is no this law of God written in their hearts and the conscience is no longer bearing witness. It is no longer speaking up, telling them what's right and wrong. But the conscience is the voice of the spirit, the human spirit. What is the conscience? It's the human spirit which has the law of God speaking up, telling you this is right and wrong. Okay. But keep in mind the conscience can be suppressed or the conscience can be awakened. It can become better and better. That means you have a very clear conscience and you have a very sensitive, a conscience that is very sensitive to the things of God, right and wrong. So immediately you can say, this is right, this is wrong. It comes like that. Because your conscience has been sensitized. It's Especially as we feed our spirit with the word of God, with the, the, the truth of God, our conscience becomes even more vacant, even more sensitized to right and wrong. So it can go either way. You know, your, the voice of the conscience can become stronger and clearer. So you clearly understand what's right and wrong, or it can be su suppressed in silence. You don't care. Like, you know. But that is one function of the human. Question? So I have uh, two questions actually. One uh, is conscience can be taught, and also another is can it also be our uh, knowledge? Can be also from our soul that we have this conscience? Because when uh, like we are describing it, recognition of right and wrong, uh, as we grow up, like we were taught right, like what is right, what is wrong, like. Mm. Lying is wrong. Mm. Stealing is wrong. 
mm. that was taught to us so we know what is right and what is wrong it was in our minds so uh is is the same way uh conscious can be taught to the spirit yeah so like we said our conscience can become more awakened that is being taught the truth of god going into our spirits right it makes our conscience even more aware of what's right and wrong so we are born every human person is born with a sense of morality that's already there so example even if we go i'm just trying to think of an example so even like, let's think of an uneducated person i mean she's never gone to school and never learned moral science or you know has no has not been given that kind of teaching example somebody in some village or some tribe or so they they uneducated no even if you ask that person example about murder is it right to kill another human being just like that he'll say no there has to be some reason right maybe if that person has attacked you then out of self defense you're protecting yourself yeah okay you're defending yourself you know that 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 is different but just random you can't go and kill somebody you can't murder somebody he will say wrong it's wrong how how do you know it's wrong nobody taught you from where are you say on what basis are you saying no no it is wrong what is that that is that sense of morality that conscience that is inside them already now by feeding them the truth of god's word or somebody is learning the truth of god's word that becomes stronger you begin to see not only is murder wrong but even hate is wrong so why are you saying hate is wrong because god's word says or unforgiveness is wrong so now we are going up to another level so right uh, so our spirit is is learning the ways of god and becoming more awakened to right and wrong to truth so that can happen what was your second question so yeah so it starts with our spirit but our mind has to be aligned to it so our mind can suppress the conscience or our mind can be aligned to the conscience so example if my conscience is saying don't do that it is wrong Ex example if i'm thinking about stealing something taking something from that belongs to somebody else first my conscience said no 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 it's not right but my mind can override it my mind can say no i want it i want to take it and my mind can reason uh, see i really need it he doesn't need it i need it and so i will take it he can get example you know if we if there, i see a phone over there i'll say i'll just take it away why i need it he doesn't need he can buy another phone my mind may reason although my conscience saying it's not right it's not yours my mind can reason and then slowly what happens the conscience is suppressed or my mind can align to it and say yeah it's not right for me to take it i won't take it then my conscience is becoming more and more stronger okay yes uh it will be developed by the word of god or it it will definitely do and it will be developed in a wrong way also right in sometimes by the wrong <coughs> wrong motives yeah uh, depending upon their uh, life and the place where they are living and the surroundings their conscience will be inspired in a wrong way also right yeah so what we say about that is the conscience is being suppressed 
Because your conscience is telling you what is right. It's speaking to you the law of God. But if they don't listen to it, that voice becomes weaker and weaker. And they have a conscience seared. So, for example, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 4, I'm not looking up all these verses on the conscience, but you know, you, you can do a full study on conscience. Uh, I'll just mention here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2. Right? It says, it's talking about these people in the last days. They are going, they depart from the faith. They listen to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So actually, they are paying attention to what? To lying spirits. And they're listening to teaching of demons. What happens? Verse 2. They speak lies and hypocrisy. How come they're able to speak lies? Uh, hypocrites. That means they know they are saying lies, but they still speak it. They'll promote their lies. How? Because their own conscience is seared with a hot iron. That means their own conscience is like it's killed. It's like you know it's destroyed. To be to sear to be seared with a hot iron is like it's like killed alive. You know it's destroyed. So they don't mind. They will tell lies. They know they're telling lies, but they'll say this is the truth. They're speaking lies in hypocrisy. So that is the condition of them. Whereas, like Paul says, you know, in Acts twenty-three. He says, I have lived with all with a clear conscience. You know, um, I'll just go there. Uh, I'll just show you this. So Acts 23 and uh, verse 1. As he is begin beginning his defense, Acts Paul says, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this. Day. Acts 23, 1. So Paul is saying, I lived with a good conscience before God. That means I was listening to my own conscience. Right? And remember, he was a Pharisee, he studied the law, so he knew the law, but at the same time, he's paying attention to his conscience. And so I lived with a good conscience. I did not go against my own conscience. Right? So both ways. So conscience and opinion are same, or is it different? So opinion is usually our minds, our thinking, you know, our rational, our logic. So you say, that's my opinion. Conscience, we usually say, I feel inside, or this is my gut feeling. So that what sometimes people call us a gut feeling, or I feel like this inside me, usually is a conscience. So it's like a little, it's, it's a deeper thing. It's from your heart. Whereas opinion, logic, is what I think is my perception. It's logic. Yeah. So that's one function, a very important function of the human spirit. And you know, as believers, we must learn to live with a good conscience. Sometimes we say, you know, we think so deeply, I'm waiting for the leading of the spirit. Sometimes you don't need the leading of the Spirit. Just live by your conscience. Example, I want to take somebody's phone. I'm waiting for the Holy Spirit to tell me, don't take the phone. No, you don't need the Holy Spirit to tell you, don't take the phone. Listen to your own conscience. What is your conscience saying? Because your conscience is the voice of your Spirit that is expressing the law of God written in your heart. Just, just listen. That's enough. You know? And very interesting, uh, this is in Romans 9, that the conscience agrees, or the spirit and the conscience agree. It's very interesting. I was going to move away from the conscience, but <laughs> uh, Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Well, last verse, then we go. What Paul is saying here, Romans 9, verse 1, he says, I tell the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit. It's very nice. That means my conscience is actually telling me what the Holy Spirit will tell me. My conscience is bearing witness in the Holy and they're both in the same line. So that is the right way to live. Where 
as a believer, your conscience and the leading of the Spirit will be aligned. So even if the Holy Spirit is not speaking, sometimes Holy Spirit will keep quiet. Why? Hey, your conscience will tell you. Holy Spirit doesn't need to speak. Your own conscience will tell you what's right, what's wrong. So we are praying, Oh Lord, reveal your will to me. Is this right? Hey, this is what your conscience is telling you. God, I'm going to steal some money. Is it right or wrong, oh God? Please reveal your will to me. Holy Spirit will be very quiet. Why? Listen to your conscience. Your conscience is already telling, and your conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit, in line with the Holy Spirit. So, uh, so that's the first function of the Spirit. Second function of the human spirit is to know spiritual things. How are we going to know? So, example, how do we know things in this natural world? Through our eyes, our ears, what we feel, what we taste and smell, all that is giving us knowing of our natural world. If one or more of our, these faculties are not working fine, to some extent, our awareness of this natural world will be affected. But the point is, it is through this that we get to know. Similarly, in the spiritual, spiritual things. Through the faculties of the spirit, your spirit is gaining knowledge of the unseen realm, of the spiritual realm. But the Function of the spirit is to know, spiritually know. So it's a, it's like what you could say, a repository of the of spiritual revelation. Your spirit, your spirit knows. You know, and sometimes it is amazing. Like example, I was, I was preparing for Good Friday sermon. And uh, yeah, so I was thinking about this the the sacrifice of the animal, and you know, then the blood, the blood that Jesus shed, and it's like a like a tube light going on in my suddenly, ah. Oh. So the question, you know, why could not animal sacrifices be sufficient? Why you had to have the sacrifice of Jesus? And those those points came. But the most important was suddenly, and I, I never I never really understood it like this until last week. That death in the Bible is threefold: spiritual, physical, eternal. Animals can only do physical death. Not spiritual death, not eternal. But Jesus, he satisfied death in all three levels. You know, maybe that that knowing was there in this in my spirit. Like maybe we all knew about it. Like, yeah. But to see the connection, right? It's, it was like something. Oh, now I see it. Right? So even for me, that like this was of course before I came to preach. But as I was preparing, right? Oh, now I can see what what was the limitation with the animal sacrifice, which the animal sacrifice couldn't do. Of course, there's a lot more. And then after preaching the sermon, I'm my, my spirit is still meditating, and then and I'm still understanding. So I was writing notes after I preached the sermon the next day on Saturday, right? I'm still like uh, understanding some more things, like about the Day of Atonement, how uh, uh, some of the things that came to me after the preaching, the message was the con difference between daily sacrifices, the substitution which is one for one and substitution one for many. You know, how come Jesus died once, but he his blood cleanses all of us, whereas there 
they had to each person had to offer his own sacrifice, one for one. But the one for many, or oh, then that's given to us in the day of atonement, once a year. On the day of atonement, one animal is sacrificed, and it it cleans it covers the sin of the whole nation. So one for many. And what was different with those daily sacrifices and this day of atonement? That blood was taken into the most holy place and put on the mercy seat. Yeah, on the day of atonement. So again, that was another new thing. Like so, my my spirit continued to meditate on this. So even after preaching the Good Friday sermon, it's like it's still beginning to understand. It's like connecting the dots. You know, it's still more revelation is coming. And I was writing my notes and putting it. Uh, I said, okay, one day I'll release it as a book uh, on the power of the blood of Jesus. And so I was writing these notes. Oh, okay, now I see even more how the blood of one can cleanse many. Right? And then other things about the blood, the power of the blood, the sprinkling of the blood, the blood covenant, and so on. So that knowing continued to happen even after preaching the sermon. So the knowing was happening as I was preparing for the sermon. I preached the sermon, but my spirit was is like continuing to meditate on that. And then I'm beginning to see more. And then every time I see more, one, one thing I do is I go and put it down. Like I don't want to forget it, right? So I write it, I put it in my computer. So I record it, you know, so type it in. Oh, okay. Oh, now I'm understanding even more about the blood of Jesus. How? Uh, so so it is it is so where is that happening? That's happening in the spirit. Right? Your spirit is receiving spiritual understanding. And then of course, your mind has to process it. Then your mind is able to understand it. Then you're able to articulate it. That means you're able to share it with others, and then you're able to apply it. Right? So the second function of the human spirit is to know, to know spiritual things. Right? And a good passage for this is in First Corinthians two, um, uh, verses you know nine to sixteen. First Corinthians two nine to sixteen, where the apostle Paul tells us, you know, the natural man cannot understand the things of God. But these are spiritually understood. That means you must understand it by the spirit. The natural man cannot understand. First, your spirit understands, then your mind follows. Your mind catches up. Your mind understands. Then your mind is able to articulate or explain it. But the first place of understanding spiritual things or about the spiritual realm is your spirit. Right? So the ability to understand spiritual things takes place in the spirit, and that comes with the help of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is our teacher. Now he's it's almost you can imagine, he's sitting with your human spirit and teaching you. Understand, understand. Then your spirit is understanding. Okay, okay, okay. Then it's coming to your mind. Oh, I'm seeing this now. I'm understanding. You know. So then you can write it down or talk, <laughs> teach it, or share it, whatever. The third function of the human spirit is for communion. So God created us as spiritual beings, so that we can commune with God, who is spirit. So God is. Spirit. And when we worship, we must worship in spirit, coming out of your spirit, spirit and truth. Right? So if you want to use the term class, so we are in that same class. We are spiritual beings as opposed to animals or trees. So we are not in the same class of trees. We don't we are not planted in the ground and hold up branches. We're not like that. We're not the same class as animals. Animals have a body and they have a you know function of the brain the, to some ex the extent. But when they die, it's gone. They don't have a spirit. We're in a class where 
God is spirit. He created us as spiritual beings. So we are in a we are in a class of beings who can operate in the spiritual realm also. And that's very important because to relate to God, we first connect with Him in the spirit. Right? So communion with God. That's another function. I commune with God. So even if my body doesn't feel like it, so my mind is not up to it, I can still fellowship with God. It's, spiritual, it's a spiritual thing. So my spirit can enter into fellowship with God and then my soul can join in slowly and my body will feel good about it slowly. But I start off in the spirit. So we ask body, body, do you feel like worshipping God? No, I feel like I'm not in the interested. <laughs> Mind, do you feel like worshipping God? No, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling sorry, I'm feeling whatever. But spirit will start. Start worshipping in the spirit. Then your soul and your body will join in. They'll also, ah, very nice. <laughs> Enjoy. So sometimes you start in the spirit. So spirit is meant for communion. Number four, another function of the human spirit is it's also a container. That means in the spirit, in our spirit, God is filling our spirit with grace, with His nature, His life, His power. What comes from God first comes into our spirit. You receive it. In your spirit. And then from your spirit, it overflows through your soul. So, example, the fruit of the spirit, love. Where is that love going to come? It comes from God, the love of God is poured into our hearts, into our spirits by the Holy. So, in your spirit, is giving you the capacity to love. Now that overrides the soul or influences the soul and then guides our actions. So sometimes the soul may be hurt, may be upset, may be angry. But love overrides that and brings that emotion under control. And then our actions follow. We express love instead of expressing hate or anger or being irritable or whatever. So the spirit is the it's a receiver and it's a container. You receive from God and you can hold that in your spirit first. What comes in your spirit. And then you release it. You give it out. The fifth function of the spirit is identity. Spiritual identity. Your spirit is is the is is what gives you spiritual identity. So in the spiritual realm, they're not looking at our passport size photograph for our identity. That doesn't matter. That passport size photograph only for natural things in this world. Spiritual world, nobody's looking at the physical man. That doesn't matter. In the spiritual world, your spirit is your identity. That's who you are. They recognize you. So your spirit is in Christ. So therefore, your identity is based on being in Christ. Your spirit is full of faith. So you recognize as a person of faith. Your spirit is bold. So you recognize as a person who is bold in the spiritual realm. Right? So understand. Your identity in the spiritual realm is based on your human spirit. So the devils were saying, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? I say, okay, in the spiritual realm, we know Jesus, we know Paul. What's your identity in the spiritual realm? In the natural realm, yeah, we know you are the sons of the priest. That doesn't matter to us. We are not afraid of that. In the spiritual realm, what is your identity? Yeah, that identity is carried in our spirit. 
and that's where we must know the truth as believers we know in the spirit we actually have our identity in jesus christ and we must walk in that identity spiritually okay and six and seven if we want to do things in the spiritual realm it is our spirit that takes action so example if i see a stone lying on on the road i can use i can use my feet i can go up to it i can use my hand pick it up and throw it out but in the spiritual realm if you see a mountain in your way you use faith and you can move the mountain or the faith in your heart can move a mountain in this natural realm it can affect both spiritual and natural realm you understand that means if you want to do things it's your spirit that's going to do it how through the means god has given us by the use of faith by the use of prayer by the use of our declaration by the use of our authority by using uh, the weapons of our warfare the human spirit is going to take it up and do it so when paul says take the sword of the spirit it is not some human sword that's on i got it on my side no 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 your spirit must take the word of god and fight so your human spirit is capable of action of doing things in the spiritual realm and from the spiritual realm also affecting the natural realm so when jesus spoke to the storm peace be still it was not just his natural voice that calmed the storm 1000 people can stand on that same boat and say peace be still nothing will happen but it was his spirit that means what is coming out of the spirit the faith coming out of the spirit is affecting what is in the natural and there's a calm so he turns around to his disciples and says where is your faith he didn't say where is your voice so where is your faith right so our spirit can take action you if you want something done you can do it first in the spirit by right? your spirit taking action through faith through serving interceding fighting using the weapons of our warfare those things we know that's how we take action uh, and uh, the last one is the spirit can keep growing part of the function of the spirit is to keep growing just like the human body it, it's born as a baby becomes you know a child a toddler a teenager uh, and a young adult and adult and goes on like that keeps on growing so the spirit function is it's also keeps growing growing into christ likeness growing in the things of god so seven functions why god has given us the human spirit seven things seven functions the human spirit serves they you know if you want you can add to this i just i uh, put this list down as uh, as from my un my understanding as these being very important okay any questions all right i see a question here in the chat after becoming a child of god and being indwelt and baptized by the holy spirit we are led by the spirit which will be right how do we differentiate between the conscience and the leading Will the conscience still be saying things contrary to the spirit, or is the conscience enlightened over a period of time? So, um, the conscience, if it is speaking, it always speaks aligned to the law of God that is written in our heart. So that's the conscience. It's the voice of the human spirit. expressing the law of god that's been written there what could happen so let's let's imagine it like this okay let's say uh there's a man who's lived a very bad life he's done all bad things so in his kids 
his conscience has been suppressed. We, we don't say conscience necessarily has become bad. We say our conscience has been suppressed. That means the voice of the conscience has been put out. Right? And this man gets saved. Okay, he becomes, so he's been doing all bad things and all. He doesn't care. Now he gets saved. Now the Holy Spirit comes and lives in him. He's hearing the word of God. So what happens? Slowly the conscience becomes, is awakens. It becomes a clear conscience. Right? And it's become, the voice of his conscience slowly becomes louder and louder. And that voice, like Paul said in Romans 9, 1, is always aligned to the voice of the Holy Spirit. So, the conscience, so to answer your question here, how do we differentiate between the conscience and the leading of the Holy Spirit? So the leading, uh, it's, it's, hard, it's hard to differentiate, but the way I would differentiate it is, one is just a feeling of what's right and wrong, whereas the other one, I know it's the Holy Spirit. Yeah, how do I differentiate? It's the Holy Spirit telling me, right? It's, it's a bearing witness too. And the other one is something, it's just like, hey, this is not right. It's my own, I, I don't feel it's right. Yeah? It's hard to differentiate because it's, a, it's ex being expressed through your human spirit. Even the leading of the Holy Spirit comes into your human spirit. Uh, so it's really hard to explain or even necessarily know. But uh, the thing is that the conscience will be uh, the voice of what's right and wrong. And the Holy Spirit is giving us information more than just right and wrong. Um, and the conscience will not be speaking contrary to the Holy Spirit. We're talking about a believer. As the conscience awakens, it's hearing the truth of God. It, it won't speak contrary to the Spirit. It'll speak aligned to the Spirit. Because the conscience is really the voice of the human spirit expressing the law of God that's written in our hearts. Right? So the word of that law is always aligned to God who gave it, the Holy Spirit who gave it. Yeah, I think that's about how much I can explain. Um, um, I hope that helps. I hope it gives some light, maybe not full light, but some understanding. Yeah. Any other questions, please? Okay, so the main takeaway, Nina, you have another question? Go ahead, please. Uh, can you hear me, Pastor? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, uh, so when it is, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, conscience is always, uh, um, I'm talking about an unbeliever. Okay. So they would, yeah, it would be different, isn't it? I mean, their sense of right and wrong, uh, it would vary. I mean, depending on what the conscience is exposed to or, uh, what has been uh, taught to them as of right and wrong, isn't it? So in that way, the conscience, uh, the, can we say that the conscience operates according to the standard it's exposed to? Or it, does everybody have that sense of right and wrong, irrespective of whether they are believers or unbelievers? Like, like of just now, yeah, you clarified about as far as the believer is concerned, it is clear. No, the holy because of the holy presence of the Holy Spirit and the law that is there, and so it it should it should be aligned. It will be aligned. But there also can we say there could be degrees, like in a, in as much as a person uh, is sensitive to the word of God or the Spirit, or you know, some things are fine, some things are not fine. That can there be degrees like that? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, be, no? yeah. Yeah. so we, we can, let's say, we talk about the believer and the unbeliever. So for a believer whose conscience is being awakened, 
um, with the word of God and um, um, uh, by the Holy Spirit. Um, the conscience increases in its awakening. It's 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 because before it was suppressed, and uh, like the Bible talks about an evil conscience, meaning the conscience is no longer operative, and because it's no longer operative, it's permitting the person to do whatever, right? So that's uh, or. Um, yeah, so that that's an evil conscience. It's been suppressed. It's been silenced, and the you know it's just letting the person. The, the, basically, the conscience is no longer doing its work. It's no longer expressing the law of God written in the hearts of the person. So we call that an evil conscience. Uh, uh, but and you know you understand the evil conscience not like the conscience is making him do evil, but it's a conscience that has just been silenced, and there's nothing there. So starting from that place, slowly it's increasing in its awareness of truths as the believer is feeding his heart and mind with the word of God. And so, yes, the degrees of conscience. That's why even in a believer, so you, you think about this, how can a, some pastor of a church go and steal money from the church? No, you think like, pastor, at least you should have your own conscience. Even the Holy Spirit is not talking to you. <laughs> at least your own conscience will tell you you should not steal money from the church. What has happened? His conscience has been suppressed. Or maybe his conscience was speaking, but he just silenced it. Keep quiet. Yeah. So the voice of that his conscience has become smaller and smaller and been suppressed. So to answer the question, yeah, there are degrees of how strong the voice of the conscience would be and the recognition of truth in the conscience. For an unbeliever, what what we can say is the conscience is completely silenced and uh, that is you know referred to as a seared conscience or a evil conscience uh, evil in the sense because their conscience is no longer stopping them from doing what's wrong and their minds have become depraved. Like if you read Romans 1, you, you, you Clara explains this. That God gave them up. He let them go to a depraved mind. So they did all kinds of things. To the point, so as the mind became depraved, the conscience just became silenced, became evil. No longer forbidding them from doing what's wrong. So in that sense, it was an evil conscience. But now when we are washed in the blood, this conscience is slowly awakened and we are fed with the truth of God's word. Yeah. All right. So, okay. So, the main takeaway is uh, we talked about the seven functions of the human spirit. So, we need to, when we say live by the spirit, we are saying let your spirit carry out these functions in you. You know, don't let your spirit be dormant. So, example, you think about a man lying sleeping. He sleeps all the time. Seven days he's sleeping. His body is not doing any function. I mean, other than maybe maybe whatever his blood is circulating, but he's not walking, running. He's not doing what his body is capable of doing. If our spirit is left like that, then these functions are dormant. It's not doing what it could do. So, um, main takeaway is operate. Let your spirit function. Let it operate. Let it do these things. You know, keep your spirit active. Don't let it be dormant. And uh, live by live by these things. Live by the spirit. You know, by our conscience, our knowing God, taking action. The spirit commune with God. You know, fill your spirit with the things of God. You know, so operate out of your spirit. So next week will be our last lesson where we'll talk about how we receive spiritually from others. Right? You can receive inputs to your spirit. Okay? All right. Okay. Thank you, everyone. God bless.